and pays reverence to the heritage of beer with offerings of classically crafted, timeless European beer styles. He's here with us tonight to talk about this philosophy and a little bit about the science of craft brewing in crafting beer, the science of brewing. So on behalf of the Academy of Science St. Louis and the Missouri History Museum, please join me in welcoming brewmaster Florian Coupland. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I'll take you through the science of brewing. So we'll be talking a little bit about how we brew beer, uh, the ingredients that we use, and then I'll talk a little bit, little bit about the um, uh, reverence and revolution series that we uh, have at Urban Chestnut and uh, hopefully give you an idea of what that is all about. So since Emily <laughs> talked about my background a little bit, uh, just show you a picture of my hometown. Uh, this is about an hour east of Munich uh, in uh, beautiful Bavaria. It's called the, the city is called Mühldorf. It is um, fairly small, about 15,000 people. Unfortunately, there's no brewery shown on this picture. Uh, there is one just outside the uh, gates of the city. Um, as you can tell, I'm originally from Germany. Uh, did my studies there, and then worked in a bunch of breweries all over the place. Ended up here in St. Louis working for one of the larger breweries in town for a while. And uh, about four years ago, decided to uh, do my own thing uh, with my business partner, Dave Wolf. And we started up Urban Chestnut. And uh, about six months ago, uh, started up brewery number two, because we're kind of uh, at capacity or beyond that. So we uh, just uh, have the second brewery running now in the Grove, which has been uh, great and has been a lot of fun. So um, with that, I'll talk a little bit about history. Um, history and science are obviously all very linked together, especially since we're here in the History Museum. Uh, nobody really knows where beer comes from. Uh, there's some speculation. Um, the best thing that people can come up with, or the best story, I guess, is that uh, somebody must have left some grains out uh, in, a, in a bowl. Um, it started raining, and then a few days later, the grains started germinating and they consumed the porridge-like mash, or whatever you want to call it, thought that it tasted fine, and uh, were kind of taken aback by the uh, effect that it had on them, which would have been the alcohol at that time, and then somehow recreated that, and then uh, several thousand years later, we're here uh, and, drinking, and still drinking beer, although the beer that we're drinking nowadays is very, or must have been very different, is, is very different from what they would have enjoyed at the time. Um, so obviously, there's a big evolution that ha has taken place over the uh, over over the time, and um, beer that we have or in consume now, enjoy now, is very different of what it would have been uh, back then. Um, just a picture here of an old brewery. You can tell it's been it was it was always very labor intensive, uh, very hard work, and fairly dangerous work as well. You had open vats. You had open flames, you had um, stuff fermenting in vats that could, uh, the CO2 that, that's produced during fermentation could potentially kill people. So it, it was a uh, fairly dangerous working environment, but I guess people still did it because the outcome was so enjoyable. So that continue, still continues to this day. Obviously there's a little bit of art involved, involved as well. We do uh, in, uh, we do use that on a daily basis when we come up with new recipes, uh, creating new things, combining ingredients to come up with uh, new beer styles and beers is, is a fun part of the, the business. And uh, I personally enjoy that very much, but it, it is, fortunately is still part of the business. So there's definitely a combination of art and science uh, that brewing is, is uh, part of. Over the ages, based on uh, different areas where people brewed beer, different beer styles became to be. Uh, a lot of factors played into this. Uh, geography, the availability of different ingredients, um, taxation, different laws, uh, the water is very important. Different areas have different types of water. Mostly the uh, mineral content is important here uh, and, would, and does play a role in the brewing of beer. Uh, Southern Bavaria, where I'm from, has very hard water. There's a lot of calcium uh, in, in the water, which doesn't 
allow uh, for brewer, doesn't allow brewers to brew a beer that's very delicate. So the the Munich Dunkel or the Munich Dark is uh, a very good example of that that area is is um, comes from that area because of the water that they were able to brew a beer that's a little bit more flavorful and kind of compensate for the sort of harsh water uh, that they had to deal with. Um, I did mention taxation, I did mention the laws a little bit. It's kind of interesting that that definitely has a big impact on uh, the evolving beer styles in certain areas. Um, brewers always try to find ways around taxation and, and, and uh, there's, there's some good examples of that where uh, you may lower the alcohol content to just pay lower taxes. Um, and throughout history, there's, there's, there's tons of uh, situations where that happened. So, not just the uh, romantic things of availability of, of certain ingredients, different hop, um, uh, hop varieties, malts, barley, different grains, spices would have played into the development of different beer styles. It was also the, the laws that were law of the land at the time. Just to give you an idea, uh, this is just a very brief overview, again, kind of tying the whole thing into science. Uh, I think there's over 60 beer styles listed here. The Great American Beer Festival uh, currently lists, I believe, over 100 styles that are actually recognized and are being judged every year in Denver uh, in October. Uh, so really just an overview just to kind of give you an idea of the variety that's out there. Uh, I always say that we as brewers are fortunate because we don't have to just rely on one ingredient. We can combine a lot of different things and create a lot of different flavors. Uh, vintners are kind of stuck with the grapes that they grow and don't have a lot, don't have a lot of uh, variability or have a lot of uh, freedom to, to come up with new flavors. As brewers, we can use different types of grains that are roasted, may not be roasted. We can use spices, we can use fruit, uh, we can use diff different hop varieties. So it's kind of fun to um, be able to use all that in and come up with different flavors. So speaking of ingredients, uh, there's obviously some major ingredients, um, and then we have some that are less traditional now and are still and kind of making their comeback a little bit uh, in the craft brewing world. So the first one is water. I already mentioned that a little bit. Water is obviously the largest ingredient in beer, 90% uh, plus, depending on the style. Uh, obviously has a big impact on the flavor, uh, has a big impact on the process itself, based on the minerals that are available or are present in the water that is being uh, used at different locations. Uh, today, as a brewer, it's fairly easy to treat the water take all the minerals out and then add stuff back that uh, would have been present at uh, different locations throughout the world and kind of recreate that water. Um, the classic beer styles that are out there are the, the Bavarian ones. Uh, Czech Pilsner is a very classic style. Uh, Paleo from Burton on Trent with a very specific uh, type of mineral in the water. So we have it fairly easy. We can remove all the stuff and then add stuff back and in that way kind of recreate those waters that would have been used to brew those classic beers. Um, here in St. Louis we're very fortunate, we have very good water, so really we, at Urban Chestnut we really don't do much, we just carbon filter um, and then uh, add some minerals to the mash, mostly calcium chloride which uh, basically just gives uh, or adds some, some calcium to the, to the, to the beer. Uh, yeast takes up calcium, so that's, that's, that's one of the things. But really, other than that, we don't do anything. Um, the water is, is, as I said, very, very good. Barley, another crucial or very important ingredient. Um, it's basically a form of grass that pretty much grows all over the world. Um, barley itself lends itself to brewing. There's other uh, grains out there that are used, but barley is really the predominant one uh, for various reasons that I'll get into in a, in a little bit. In the US, the big growing areas are in the uh, northern part of the country. Um, Dakotas, a uh, little bit in, in um, Idaho, a little bit in Washington State, a little bit in California, and then um, also 
much into Canada. So a lot of the malt, a lot of the barley that we're getting comes from those states and from Canada as well. We do import a little bit from Europe. The barley varieties that are grown there are somewhat different from what is grown here in North America uh, and will give a different taste to the beer and hence we will uh, use those for the more European style beers. We don't really use barley per se, we use malt, we use barley malt. So there's a step in between before the barley gets to the brewery and that's called malting. Uh, in the past, most breweries used to have malt houses on site. Uh, today that's a little bit different. Very few breweries still have malt houses or their own maltings on site and they just buy malt from a malt maltster. Uh, most of them are located in the upper Midwest, close to where the barley is grown. Um, during the malting process, uh, the, there's some losses associated with that and um, it wouldn't make sense to truck the barley to the brewery and then malt it there. So transportation comes into place. You take the losses and then truck the, the, the product that's ready to go from the malt house to the brewery. Um, if you've ever done the Anza Bush tour and walk down uh, past the brew house, kind of down, down that hill. On the left, there's still a building that's called Malt House. So AB used to have their own maltings on site. They don't do any, that anymore, uh, obviously, but the building is still there. So malting is basically um, the germination of barley or wheat or rye, but mostly barley. So basically recreating what would have happened back uh, when people discovered beer. Uh, basically, the barley is submersed in water, the barley plant starts growing, um, after a few days the, the rootlets are actually showing, um, and what happens there is that the starch that is available in the barley that you could turn into flour is being degraded into sugars. Starch is basically just a um, long form of sugars and the naturally occurring enzymes that are available in the barley kernel break that starch down and uh, create some of the sugars that we then uh, use to make beer. The yeast will take up the sugars and produce alcohol and CO2. Um, this process would normally happen or normally happens. So the reason why it happens is uh, the barley plant can't uh, utilize the starch either. It's just a way to store energy basically. And it would, during its growth process, use that uh, reservoir of energy, break it down into sugars, and then um, utilize that to grow. And uh, we kind of cheat the plant out of that a little bit, uh, start the growth process, but then we dry the um, barley kernel and then produce malt. So there's two big steps in that process, the germination and then the drying. So after about six, seven days, the kernel is dried in a big kiln. And then depending on what temperatures are used, um, and the amount of uh, humidity that, that, that's left in the chamber. Uh, we produce lighter malt, which typically is called pale ale or pilsner malt, or if we use higher temperatures or even roast the barley, you would get a roasted barley malt or um, chocolate malt or caramel malt, kind of anything from very light to very dark is what uh, we have available as, to us as brewers. Typically, um, pilsner malt or pale ale malt is a base malt. So even for the darkest of beers, there would be a small amount, or there would be a decent amount of, of uh, pale malt or pilsner malt uh, that is used to brew that beer. The reasons are the enzymes that are uh, available during the mashing process, uh, sorry, during the malting process uh, are being carried over into the brewing and then we use those again to uh, mash and to produce more sugars. Dark malts, really dark malts, don't have any of those enzymes, so we want to make sure we have enough enzyme in the mash. The next ingredient that is very important is hops. Uh, basically hops are the flower of the hop plant. You can see a good example here. Uh, right now we're starting harvest season uh, all over there, well actually just in the uh, northern hemisphere. So they're starting harvesting in uh, the Pacific Northwest as well as in, in, in Europe. The largest growing area is actually not too far from where I grew up. <clears throat> it's shown here uh, as number two. The area is called Hallertau. Uh, it's just north of Munich, probably about 45 minutes or so. Uh, and that's by the 
amount of hops produced and by the area that is being cultivated that's the largest growing area in the world. Uh, if you drive on the uh, highway from Munich to Berlin, you'll see miles and miles of the hop fields right next to the, to, to the street. It's kind of impressive because they uh, grow them on tall uh, structures and uh, it looks fairly depressing in the winter when there's nothing growing, but in the summer and the, the, the early fall when, when it's harvest time, it's really nice to look at. There's some smaller growing areas outside of that. Uh, Tetnang, close to Lake Constance, also in Germany. Uh, Alsace, close to uh, uh, Strasbourg in, in France. And then a uh, smaller growing area also in Kent in England. Uh, some hops are grown in the Czech Republic and um, Austria. But as I said, the main growing areas are shown here on this slide. In the US, actually here we have the second largest growing area in the world, uh, that's in Yakima Valley. Um, a very dry area, so all the fields are irrigated. So most of the hops in the US come, come from that area. And then there's also a decent amount of hops growing uh, just so south of Portland <clears throat> in the Willamette Valley and then a little bit in Idaho as well. Um, from a hop grower's perspective, Yakima is ideal because they don't have to deal with the humidity, the moisture that's in the air. They can irrigate uh, the hops, can get it as much water as it needs, but don't have to worry about, about the diseases that are associated with the uh, um, uh, wet, wet to weather that's present in, in and around Portland. So when we look at the hop plant, the only thing that we're really interested in as brewers is, uh, or are the lupulin glands. That's this yellow stuff here that you find in the hop flower. Um, and the compounds that are responsible for bittering beer and for adding grassy, floral, spicy, citrusy aromas and flavor to the beer are found in those uh, lupulin glands. Um, typically, when the hops is harvested, uh, it is dried first to reduce, reduce the, the moisture content, otherwise it wouldn't store very long. And then uh, most of the hops is now uh, made into pallets. And basically all the, or a lot of the green leafy material is removed and just the good stuff that we use in the brewing process uh, is kept and then utilized during, during the, the process of brewing. Just to give you an idea here, this is what a hop farm can look like. Uh, this is our main supplier in, in Bavaria that supplies us with hops. Uh, very scenic, uh, as I said, looks, looks very beautiful. They have their uh, farm right up here on top of the hill. And then uh, some of the hops grown here, uh, we will actually use in, in, in our beers. Uh, I think this hop field here is uh, the probably most traditional Bavarian hop variety that's grown. It's called Halatau Mittelfrü, so semi-early is the translation. Um, so it's a variety that's harvested semi-early. Uh, back in the days, they didn't have too many different varieties, so it was kind of uh, distinguished when the variety would ripen. And I guess most of them are somewhat related anyway, so it wasn't um, cool to give them new names or, or separate names like, like uh, is done nowadays. Um, Typically, hop farms in, in Bavaria are fairly small compared to here in the US, um, and they typically have other crops as well, just to kind of spread the risk a little bit. Just here, a picture of how hops is harvested. I did mention that it gets grown on these uh, huge structures, and then uh, the hops grows up a little string until it reaches the top here and then ripens. It is fairly labor inten intensive to grow hops, uh, they're tiny little plants in the spring, and then uh, they have to get trimmed on those uh, strings throughout the spring and make sure that they grow up there. They also cut back uh, some of the plants to make sure there's only a couple of the healthy ones that make it up the string. And then, uh, obviously, maintenance of those structures throughout the winter is pretty uh, labor-intensive as well. Um, as I said, we're only interested in the flower, so typically every farm has a huge machine where the flowers get taken off the, uh, the plants itself and then dried on site and then typically they ship them to uh, larger facilities where they palletize them. So palletizing starts in the kind of mid to 
late fall and then continues throughout the winter. And uh, then the hops get stored in uh, big cooling chambers and then distributed to, to the different breweries. Um, hop availability is a little bit of an issue these days. Uh, there's lots of craft brewers using more hops than has traditionally been, been done by uh, the bigger breweries. And there's a fascinating statistic that I just read a few weeks ago. Um, the craft beer market in the US is about 10% by volume of the total beer market. But those 10% uh, of beer that's made that uh, Use, it uses 50% of the hops that's grown, or that, that's, that's, that's used total. So 10% of the brewers, or 10% of the beer made, uses up 50% of the hops that, that's used in the US, which I find fa fairly fascinating. So if there's more growth in the craft beer industry, um, hop availability could be a problem. It's already tight with some varieties, but um, uh, there's a lot more being put into the ground but uh, could still be a problem. As you can see, those things are fairly, they grow fairly high. If there's a storm that grows, goes through one of those fields, it could knock down quite a bit of the, uh, the plants and then really reduce the harvest that's available. So there's always risk so associated with that. Hence, uh, we buy hops from all different kinds of uh, areas of the world just to make sure in case something catastrophic happens, we have a fallback to, to other uh, hop varieties. And last but not least, yeast. Uh, yeast is a very small organism that basically just lives on sugar, uh, takes the sugar and produces alcohol and CO2 and some other flavors that are responsible for the specific flavor and aroma of a beer. Um, there's two types of yeast strains that are used or mainly used. Uh, those are called ale yeast that make ale and lager yeast that makes lagers. Uh, ale yeasts are the more uh, historic ones uh, and are very diverse. They would have been used by brewers all over the world. Um, well, basically brewers didn't know what yeast is. They didn't know uh, what made that switch from sugary liquid into beer. They just knew something was going on and yeast would have come from the air. Uh, it is available or it, it is present in uh, areas where there's a lot of farming, uh, apple trees, anything sweeter would have had or does have yeast in the air and that used, yeast would have somehow gotten into the beer and then fermented the beer and I think eventually people or brewers would realize that they could reuse what they had left from the last fermentation, use it for the next fermentation and somehow recreate the flavors that they got with that yeast. And that's how yeast strains became more cultivated. And uh, now a lot of breweries actually have their own yeast strain that they use to make their beer. And then there's, hence, there are some different flavors that are being produced by that. Uh, ale yeasts are typically used at slightly higher temperatures, typically around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, produce beers that are a little bit more fruity, a little bit more flavorful. Um, and lager yeasts are used at slightly lower temperatures, anywhere from like 45 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. The beers that are produced by lager yeast are typically a little bit cleaner, a little bit crisper, and uh, lager is now the predominant style uh, in the world. I don't exactly, but I, I would say roughly about 90% plus of the beer produced in the world is lager. Lager strains are a little bit less diverse in terms of the genetics. They uh, People say they can be traced back to two original strains and uh, that's why they're all fairly genetically similar uh, and produce beers that are somewhat similar. If you drink a, a Budweiser or a Heineken or a German lager, they all somewhat taste similar because of the, the yeast that's being used and because of the similarities, the genetic simi similarities of those yeast strains. There are some other ingredients uh, that are being used, spices, uh, other types of grains, but those four are really uh, the vast majority and, and make up basically what we use on a daily basis in a brewery. So we talked about ingredients, now it's time to look at the process itself. Uh, so this is basically a quick rundown of what we do in a brewery. It does start with the malt that we get from a maltster, uh, either being stored in malt silos or in bags. And as I mentioned before, uh, we do get 
different types of malt. So we get a base malt that is used for different beers. And then colored malts, car caramel malts, chocolate malts that we use for some of the darker beers um, to give it color, to give it different flavor, um, and give it some of the sweetness that you can find in some beers. So the, the, real, the, the first real step in the brewing process that, we typically, that typically happens uh, on site is milling. And it's basically, uh, we can't really do anything with the kernel itself. We have to be able to get to the starch and the sugar. Uh, and we do that by basically grinding the malt in a mill. Typically that's rollers that uh, turn and crush the grain and produce a uh, flour. Very important though that we don't uh, destroy the husks because we use those uh, in a later step of the process which I'll mention in a minute. So we've got uh, the milled malt or grist as we call it that gets mashed in with water into the mash tun or the mash kettle. Um, here the idea is to extract the sugars and the starch and some other components that are available in the kernel and make them soluble, get them into, the, into water. Uh, beer is liquid, so we have to liquefy the uh, kernel uh, and that happens in that second stage of the process. There's still some enzymes available uh, that started working during the malting process, we continue to use those to break down starch into sugar, and then there's some proteins that get broken down into smaller molecules, and that happens during mashing. Uh, basically, mash looks like a porridge, kind of white in the beginning because of the starch that's available, and then throughout the mashing process, it starts getting a little bit lighter uh, and looks kind of brownish towards the end, and that uh, is basically the sugary liquid that, that we end up with. Um, typically, the mash gets heated throughout different uh, stages, again, to make the enzymes work at their optimum temp temperature. So we still have a mash or a kind of porridge looking like liquid. Um, we don't want all those chunks in the beer, so we have to separate them out. And that happens in the louder ton. And basically all we do here is to have a false bottom at the bottom of this tank and we separate the liquid, sugary liquid, which we call wort, from the spin or the, the grains or the husks and then pump those in the brew kettle. The, I did mention that the husks are important. Uh, they basically act as a filter bed during this process. We add some more water on top of this to extract more sugar and then um, at the end of the process, the, what we call spent grains, so the husks and everything that's left over, the solid part, gets removed from that tank and then typically sent to farmers. There's still a lot of protein in this and um, uh, farmers love it because we give it away for free and they feed it to cows. Uh, if you go to YouTube and Google urban chestnut and spent grain or cows. There's a video of uh, our farmer bringing out the uh, spent grain to the cows and they come running, running from across the field. So they really enjoy that stuff. Um, you can also bake bread with it. There's some uh, nutritional benefits. Um, it's not very flavorful and it's not sweet anymore because we already extracted all the sugar. So not, not a huge um, benefit to, to humans, but as I said, the cows love it. The next step is boiling the wort in the brew kettle. So we have a brownish looking liquid that's very sweet. Uh, we boil that, add hops to it. Uh, the hops, the hop aromas and hop flavors and the bittering substances get extracted from the hops. Uh, we sterilize the wort and then also evaporate some water to uh, adjust the strength of the wort. So depending on how much sugar, or sorry, depending on how much malt was used in the beginning based on a standard uh, volume of water, the higher the malt content, the stronger the beer is going to be. Um, it could be fairly dark if we used some dark malts um, or fairly light if we used more, mostly lighter malts. And then the almost final step is to remove the hops again in a uh, tank that we call Whirlpool. Uh, if you've ever, um, or if you drink tea, have tea leaves in a cup and you spin the, uh, the, the tea with a spoon, the tea leaves will separate in the center of the cup. Um, same principle is used for the 
separating the hops out in, in the whirlpool. And um, it's basically just the wort is being pumped in the tank, it spins around and the hop particles settle out in the center and then we can draw off the wort and uh, send it through the heat exchanger and cool it down. That's basically what happens here. Um, this whole process typically takes anywhere from 8 to 12 hours, sometimes a little short, shorter, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, and we call it the hot site. So every, every part of the process, except for the milling, uh, employs heat. And uh, the tanks are typically heated, and the liquid in the ward is hot. This changes when we go through the heat exchanger. Uh, we basically recapture that energy by having hot wort on the one side of, of a plate and then have cold water on the other side. That energy gets ex exchanged, we produce hot water and then uh, cold wort on the other side. Um, the hot water is typically used for mashing in the next brew so there's some energy uh, regeneration that happens. Next step is fermentation. Um, that's where yeast gets added. So yeast um, gets added to the, to the wort and then slowly starts its process. Uh, basically takes up sugars, produces alcohol and CO2, which are symbolized here by the bubbles. Um, towards the end of the process, we will close the tank, let pressure build up, and that's uh, how we carbonate the beer naturally, basically. Depending if it's an ale or, or a lager, uh, this will take anywhere from three to seven, eight days. And then we typically have a maturation process that could take up to several months. Uh, similar to wine maturation, flavors develop, uh, mature over time, and then yeast will settle out at the bottom of the tank and then gets reused for the next batch. Um, it is important to uh, work or to keep the tank sterile and keep it clean. Uh, in the early processes, we boil the wort. So really there's not a whole lot of risk for any other bacteria to do any damage. But in this uh, part of the process, we have a sugary liquid um, at a nice temperature. So there's some other organisms that could grow in there. So we have to make sure as brewers to keep that clean and all, always just use pure brewer's yeast to be able to control the outcome and produce a consistent beer. Typically, once the beer is done, uh, the yeast gets removed. The yeast that's still in suspension gets removed, removed through a uh, filter or a separator. Uh, and then you end up with a beer that's very clear or somewhat cloudy still. Really just a question of what the brewer tries to achieve. And then uh, it just gets stored in a finishing tank, finished beer tank, uh, and is pretty much ready for packaging. Uh, typically, we do different QA controls, uh, um, QA checks to make sure that the beer is up to standard. Um, and then we pump the beer to our packaging lines. First one here that's briefly shown is kegging. Kegs are basically just small little tanks that are used to transport the beer around. I'm sure you've seen them. Um, typically, they're made out of stainless steel. Um, get cleaned on the inside on a machine, uh, get purged with CO2, and then get filled with beer. Uh, the nice thing about that is the beer doesn't ever see the uh, light of day, so it gets continuously uh, kept in a enclosed environment up until the point to where it gets dispensed at a bar or a restaurant. Um, once the keg is empty, the restaurants send the kegs back, and then the whole cycle starts again. The kegs get cleaned, filled, and sent out again. Um, back in the days, they used to have kegs or, or, or uh, uh, casks that were open, had to be closed. Again, we kind of took a little bit of risk out of the process by keeping that closed and filling the, the beer under a sterile atmosphere. The other thing that can happen with the beer uh, is bottling. Again, you're familiar with, with uh, bottles you can buy in a supermarket. Again, really just a smaller version of a tank that's used to tra transport the beer from the brewery to the uh, beer drinker. Similar principle uh, to keg filling. We basically get the bottles, rinse them out. Typically, they're new coming from a uh, glass manufacturer, but we want to make sure there's no dust or anything in there that may have gotten picked up during the transportation. 
Um, we take out the oxygen by uh, applying a vacuum. Uh, oxygen is very bad for beer. It will uh, destroy it over time, age it, and we want to keep it as fresh as possible. So we take the oxygen out of the bottle, fill it with CO2, and then uh, start filling the bottle from the bottom up until the bottle is full. Uh, it gets capped with a crown, typically, and then is ready for uh, being put into a box and, and palletized. And then the beer gets stored uh, in coolers, ready for shipping to wholesalers and um, restaurants and, and bars. One thing I'm not showing is canning, really very similar process. Uh, the difference is just that it's a different t type of tank that the, or different type of vessel the beer is put into. But in terms of filling process, it's pretty much the same as filling a bottle. So the equipment that we use uh, during this process uh, nowadays is mostly made from stainless steel. Uh, stainless is very easy to, or fairly easy to clean. It's uh, sanitary and pretty much th throughout the uh, food industry, that's the, the material of choice. Back when they didn't have access to stainless steel, all different kinds of materials were used. It could have been uh, wooden vessels, copper, uh, stone, pretty much anything that was available at the time. But as I said, pretty much 99.9% of vessels now, and when you walk into breweries, all stainless steel. Sometimes you still see the copper vessels in the brew house, in the, in the brewing area, uh, which look very, very pretty, but uh, most of the time they actually have stainless steel tanks underneath. Uh, copper is a very soft metal, uh, very hard to clean because it's so, um, would be attacked by, by cleaning chemicals. Uh, so typically they're just being used as a, as a showpiece, but not as, a, as the actual tank that uh, it, the beer is brewed in. I did mention quality control a little bit. Uh, very important part of the process. Really starts from the brew house or the brewing, the mashing, boiling the wort, fermentation to where the beer is ready to go into kegs and, and bottles. Uh, we take different measurements, we, take, we look at different parameters. Uh, the acidity, the pH is very important. Uh, the cell count, how many yeast cells we have in a, in a certain amount of liquid is very important. Different flavor uh, compounds that uh, we do want or don't want in the beer um, are being looked at. And then also the sugar content, uh, which decreases throughout fermentation and then hits a certain point. Um, and we monitor that pretty closely throughout the, the brewing process in the lab. Uh, we look at alcohol content, obviously, to, again, keep the consistency. And we also do look at the bitterness that the beer has, um, again, to keep that consistent. You don't want a beer that's one day is very bitter and then all of a sudden becomes very uh, mild. We want to keep that consistent. Tasting is a big part of that. Um, there's really no, well, there may be machines, but they're all very expensive. Uh, the human tongue and the human nose can really pick up a lot of different nuances in the beer uh, that machines really can't do, so that gives us the opportunity to taste, to taste our product throughout the process, which is also a benefit of the, the job, I guess. So we do have taste panels on a, on a consistent basis just to compare different batches to each other, make sure, again, to have consistency throughout. We are dealing with uh, ingredients that come from a field, from a farm. They do change over time, just like uh, wine grapes change from year to year. So um, we have to make sure to change the recipe based on those uh, ingredients that we be, get into the brewery and kind of adjust based on what we get in there to make sure that the beer ends up being uh, the same every time that we brew it. So that was pretty much the brewing process. Uh, very brief, but hopefully you, you, you got some idea of, of what we do in breweries. Uh, and I would uh, welcome you to, to come visit our breweries and other breweries in town. It is fairly fascinating and it's, it's a fun uh, process that uh, all of us pretty very very much enjoy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, philosophy that we use at Urban Chestnut. Uh, we call it beer divergency. So we look at very historic uh, beer styles and then also come up with new um, styles, flavors, recipes. And it's kind of broken up into old world. Uh, we call it the Reverend Sears 
in the new world, which we call Revolution Series. Revan series, as I mentioned, are a reproduction or recreation of very classic styles or our interpre interpretation of that. Uh, we brew styles from Germany, Belgium, the Czech Republic, England, um, and <clears throat> try to use ingredients that are typically used for those beers. So we do import hops, malt uh, from, from those areas to really recreate those flavors. We use yeasts that are typically used for making those beers and um, really try to focus on recreating the flavors so that you can walk into our brewery and hopefully get the same experience that you would have in a beer hall in, in Munich uh, but when you drink one of our German style beers. Uh, this picture is from the uh, main square of the town that I went to university. It's called Freising and I thought uh, it just looked nice. It has a lot of brewing history and uh, um, I thought that was fitting for that, for that topic. Revolution series, on the other hand, uh, we try to come up with new recipes, um, use different ingredients that may not traditionally be used to brew beer. Uh, we have a series of um, single hop uh, ales, IPAs, basically just showcasing a single hop variety. Uh, there's a lot of different flavors, a lot of different aromas in different hop varieties, and we really try to showcase those that we wouldn't be able to do in a typical, in a classic beer style. So the two flagships that we have is Twickle on the Reverend side and uh, Wingnut on the Revolution side. Twickle is a very classic Bavarian style lager and uh, Wingnut is a, a chestnut ale. A little bit about the name uh, Urban Chestnut. The urban part comes from the resurgence of craft beer in urban centers like St. Louis. Um, and the chestnut part or part of the name comes from the fact that uh, Bavarian brewers used chestnut trees to shade their beer cellars when they didn't have artificial refrigeration. They basically just harvested ice out of lakes and streams in the winter, kept that ice in uh, the beer cellar to cool the beer throughout the year, um, and then eventually figured out they should plant chestnut trees over those cellars to keep the sun away, and I guess eventually sold beer under those trees, and that's how beer gardens became to be. So nice, nice tie into the, into the old world. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got a bunch of other beers. Uh, feel free to try them when you visit. And that is pretty much it. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yes? What does the term porter imply? Porter? Um, the, I think the theory is that porters were manual laborers in London that were lugging stuff around uh, and they used to l enjoy that, that beer style, this darker uh, beer and I guess that's why it was named porter. So porter is a, it's an English beer style that's um, Similar to a stout, not quite as strong typically, not, as, not quite as bitter, not quite as dark. Um, but that's, that's a theory, that they liked that beer because it was giving them strength, I guess, and um, hence the name Porter. Yes? I had a question about your uh, products you use. Um, do you source your leaf yeast domestically, or do you actually import some as well? Uh, so the yeast, there's various locations throughout the world that have, where there's yeast banks and they will collect yeast from all over the place. So we have our own collection, um, but it is yeast strains that uh, were collected in, in Germany, were collected in, in Bavaria and England. So if we need something, there's some pretty good domestic sources, but they would have yeast strains that would have come from Europe at some point or from South America or from uh, different vintners that, that used a specific strain to, to make their, their wine. So domestically mostly, but um, as I said, the, the diversity is, 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 is very nice. And thanks to technology, we have the capability of getting yeast pretty easily these days. So it's a, it's a good way of creating different flavors. Yes? Um, and so do you keep the yeast, do you keep it on like plates or in slats or do you uh, so we have a, the best way to keep yeast is frozen. Uh, it's quite amazing. Um, yeast stored in liquid nitrogen, nobody really, I mean the technology has only been around for 30, 40, 50 years maybe. 
So nobody really knows how long yeast will stay alive or how long it will stay uh, good under those conditions. But uh, I've, I've read an um, article once and they say it's hundreds of thousands of years that you could store the yeast under liquid nitrogen. So it's extremely cold. Humans would not even, I mean, it's very dangerous, that temperature. But yeast cells, for some reason, are able to survive under those conditions. Uh, we don't have liquid nitrogen in our lab. We do, we do have a, a freezer, basically, that cools the yeast to very low temperatures. Um, and we store them in little vials. And then whenever we need it, we, we just take it out of that, basically. And that's typically the technology that people use. Um, I did my previous employer. We uh, pulled some yeast out that had been uh, collected, I believe, about 40, 45 years ago. Um, and it took a few hours, not even days, for the yeast to come right back. So it's, it's pretty amazing. 40 years, no food, nothing. Uh, you just pull it out of the freezer, give it a little bit of wort, a little bit of sugar, and it starts growing right up. It's, it's quite an amazing organism. Yes? Is there a correlation to the bottle type that you use for, your, for different beers? Like I know there's different glasses, glasses for certain years in the sake of bottling. Um, we, it's, I hate to say this, but it's marketing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one thing, brown glass protects beer from the sun. Um, there's a compound in hops that will turn skunky if UV light hits it. Uh, so if you have a beer bottle or even beer glass that sits out in the sun, it's clear the beer will turn skunky and it will, I, I'm sure you've smelled what skunks smell like. <laughs> it's not very pleasant, but it, it will, it will, it's a, it's a sulfur compound that, that, uh, basically reacts with the, with this, with the sunlight and then turns into that. So most brewers don't want that, uh, to happen. So, um, brown glass is typically used. There's some ways around that, but most people don't use those. Um, that's why you see brown glass mostly, but yeah, the shape is, pretty much marketing. And there's some practical reasons for different shapes and how you use them in the brewery, but yeah, it's making it look nice. Yes? Do you find that there's any difference in flavors or aromas between using pellets and holy? There's people that swear that there's differences between that. Um, I, I can't say that we've really discovered it. We have the capability of using whole leaf hops so basically the dried version, typically they are dried. Um, we are gonna make a fresh hop beer actually in the next couple of weeks where the hops that are harvested don't get dried, they just get thrown into the brew kettle without any drying. But typically they get dried and then you basically have those uh, flowers that are stored versus the pellets that we get. Um, typically, at least that's my theory, um, the pellets get stored under a nitrogen atmosphere. We can freeze them. They take up way less space and it's much easier to, to keep fresh throughout the year versus the uh, holy flowers that typically are, I mean, there, there's some bags that, that can be used, but they take up so much space. <clears throat> it's much harder to keep the oxygen out. So in whatever may be gained by using holy flowers, I think if they don't use, if they're not used fresh, I think the quality uh, of pellets throughout the year is, is way more beneficial. At least that's, that's my, my take on that. Uh, is there a difference? Possibly, but it's not something that's very obvious, I, I think. So, so how come some of the brewers use green bottles, some use clear bottles? Uh, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it really comes down to that. There's some coatings you can put on the bottles to prevent that from happening. Um, there's a large brewery in the world that I think people are actually used to that slightly skunky flavor, um, so they don't want anything else. Um, there's some ways of changing the hop to stop that or not even have the, the, that reaction occur. You can use those products. Um, but yeah, it's marketing. <laughs> yes? Uh, pretty great. Versions of craft beer just here at St. Louis. Uh, is there any plans on like collaborating with some of the other brewers? Yeah, we actually just formed the St. Louis Brewers Guild. It's probably been a year ago now. Um, we we do have some 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 stuff in the works. It's not nothing nothing to be to be announced quite yet. But yeah, we we actually work very close together. Um, we are all friends. We are uh, there's a new uh, festival that we're planning, a harvest festival, which will happen. 
sometime in September, I believe, where people will showcase their fresh hop beers and pumpkin beers. And uh, I think we have 15 breweries confirmed at this point. So yeah, we were all working close together and that's large to small. So it's, it's a very family-like uh, industry that, that uh, is really, really, I, I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's really, really fun. We, we will bring Count Orlock, yes. <laughs> yes? Uh, can you explain uh, why you named the Bearded Circle? I don't know what the circle is, but I think related to that. So the, the Zwickle is a sampling valve on a fermentation tank. Um, and it's actually Zwickle's a beer style. I'm not exactly sure where that name comes from or where that term comes from. Uh, it, it, Germanic name, but it's actually being used in English brewing. So. Uh, uh, the, the, the sample valves here in the U.S. are being called Swickle uh, by brewers. Um, and the idea here is that it's basically a beer that's unfiltered, that's as natural as it would be as if you were to drink it right from the tank. And hence, hence the name Swickle for that. Not sure who was first. Sorry, back there. Um, I, was, I was wondering what your opinion was or what you think the future of is the um, Swickle Brewing Company. Because I know that's like a German so there, there's a law in Germany um, that's called the Reinheitsgebot, which means purity law, and basically only allows brewers to use uh, malt, water, hops, and yeast, and that dates back to 1516. Um, and the reason why they did it at the time, because brewers were probably cheating and adding some other stuff to the beer, and it was getting dangerous. So it's kind of the first food or, or custom consumer protection laws that's that's still somewhat out there. Um, with the European Union, it's going to be hard to enforce that. I think right now, I was actually just in Germany a week ago, and that's big discussion right now. There's a lot of smaller breweries starting to do some interesting things. Um, I think all it's going to take is somebody that gets sued and then goes to the European courts, and probably it's it will get overturned, which probably means, I, I wouldn't be surprised if brewers still continue to use it as a marketing thing, but um, it really is just a historic thing that, or historic law that, that's been used. And I think the problem is brewers have been telling their beer drinkers, this is brewed according to this purity law and it's, everything else is bad. So now they're kind of in a little bit of a bad position because now if they want to do something else, it's kind of hard to justify that. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. But I think from a legal perspective, it's going to have to go away just because of the, the way the European Union is structured. Yeah, that's my take on that. Yeah, I think there was somebody else back there. Yeah. Is that a picture of your facilities on This is on, uh, on Washington. So that's the, the, the brewery in, in Midtown with the beer garden next to it. Yes? When you're coming up with new recipes, I assume you're on a smaller batch scale. When you go up to a larger batch, is there anything of the brewing process that doesn't scale up in um, So we have the brewery here, which you can sort of see here on the left. Uh, that's really our pilot brewery. So our original brewery at Midtown, uh, we make, uh, as brewers, we use barrels. A beer barrel is 31 gallons. So we make 20, gallon, 20 barrel batches, so about 600 gallons per batch uh, in one of these tanks. Um, th there's differences because the equipment is always slightly different. So with the new equipment that we have, we had to adjust the amount of hops just slightly because the uh, yield was a little bit better and then the brew house, so just adjusting that. So there's some, some, some fine tuning that has to be done, but for the most part, it sort of scales fairly well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be done different brewers do it differently we add the the pumpkin to the to the wort so it's basically a, a, a pureed version of pumpkin that gets added to the wort but some brewers add it to the mash um, yeah it's just a different recipe basically yes yeah when you have you got to get it right the first time. We're pretty close to right the first time. I mean, that's basically reality. I mean, we, we, we have the luxury of 
the tanks that we have at the, the new brewery, they hold two batches, two, two uh, brew house batches. And then typically we blend a little bit. So if we had to adjust, I mean, we, we got pretty close. There's some, I would say 10%, within 10% for most parameters. And then those 10%, you just brew another one where you compensate and then just blend the beer together just to make it consistent. Um, pretty much reality in every brewery. You try to blend as much as possible just to kind of uh, compensate for any, any changes that may occur. I mean, as I said, we're, we're working with natural ingredients, so there's always some slight changes that happen, and uh, that's kind of part of the fun. So, uh, down here. What, I keep hearing more about celery in here. What's going on in the bottle when it's in somebody's basement? So typically, storing beer in a bottle is bad, generally. The older the beer, it's like a food. The longer you store it, there's going to be some stuff that happens that deteriorates the quality of the beer. But there are some beers uh, that may have different organisms, microorganisms in it, or are stronger, that will improve over time. Um, there's some sour beers that have lactic acid bacteria that will turn the beer sour on purpose uh, that will improve the flavor. Um, there's other stuff that probably hasn't been totally uh, discovered yet, but there's still some reactions that will, I mean, it's similar to aging wine. Once, you, once you're above a certain alcohol percentage, I think uh, there's certain reactions that will happen and will kind of make the wine or beer taste different. I don't want to say that there's every beer is going to age the same. I'm sure there's a prime, and at some point it's going to go downhill from there. But um, that's kind of the, the the idea behind that. A lot of small batch specialty stuff. But typically, if you buy a beer in the supermarket, your average beer is going to deteriorate slowly. But it will, as I said, the fresher it is, typically the better it is. The banana fruity esters and it's really just part of the the, 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 the reactions of the yeast that, that it's going through and um, it's very specific yeast strains that produce those flavors um, but yeah we don't add banana we don't add any really just the yeast that makes those flavors yeah have you ever tried a weird ingredient like just what's the weirdest thing that you've tried to find? that I personally tried in beer is probably bacon I've, I've had some <laughs> bacon beers I've tried a, a beer that was brewed by somebody at home and they try to recreate I think like a roasted chicken which was very very convincing the flavor was there I can't say that I would have had a lot of that but it was tasted like roasted chicken um, we are probably not quite as adventurous when it comes to stuff like that I mean we we do use fruits we use chestnuts we use different uh, spices um, pumpkin but yeah, that's pretty much as crazy as we get, I guess. What's a uh, wind speed? Uh, that's a smoked beer. Um, so traditionally when malt was made, they have to dry the green malt or the, the yeah, the, the, the stuff when it still has the rootlets. And when, old technology was to just basically have a fire underneath that and then draw it with the hot air, uh, dried with the hot air. Today it's indirect, they're just, they're just blowing hot air through that was uh, heated through a heat exchanger. But if you add a small fire under the kiln and draw the smoke into the malt, it will get smoky and then the beer will get smoky as well. And that's, that's basically what we used for that, for that specific beer. Think uh, Scottish whiskey. Some of those whiskeys um, have a slightly smoky flavor and that basically happens when they uh, use um, peat to dry the malt, and then that gets carried into the whiskey. It's very, very same principle, basically. Yes? Weems wheat, it was a pretty much one-time deal. We do smoke, we do make smoked beers every once in a while. They're not the biggest seller. It probably, it's very, it takes a while to get used to them, but um, still fun to kind of try the different things. Uh, is there anything that you're canning right now? If not, is that a road that you're willing to go down in the future? We don't can anything right now, um, possibly in the future. We've talked. We don't have the facility right now. We don't have a canning line. Uh, that would be another investment into new machinery, possibly. We've been talking about it, but nothing, nothing in the plans and nothing in the works right now. Yes. And your beer has a, like a nice creamy mouthfeel to it. Do you get that by you do infusion mashing and step or decoction mashing? Uh, all of the above. Um, so there's different ways of 
mashing, different ways of heating. You can boil parts of the mash. You can just heat um, the whole thing up and then based on using different uh, types of mashing, you will get different flavors. But yeah, we do, we do, mostly it's infusion mashing where we just heat to a different rests, uh, but we do do a little bit of decoction mashing as well. Yes? When you purchase your malt, you purchase it like caramel or chocolate or smelt, or do you manipulate it once? No, we just use it as, as is basically. So we would, yeah, we would, so in the brewery we have larger amounts of Pilsner and Pale Ale malt, and then we get Munich malt, caramel malt, and in bag quantities, and we just uh, have that available, and then based on recipes, we select what malt we want to use for a specific brew, and then that gets milled. But yeah, we don't do anything with that anymore. We really don't have the capacity to do anything with that. Yes? How is your distribution through your brewery work? Uh, we actually just announced that we're going to start distributing in Columbia, uh, Missouri, and we're looking at, or we're going to add Kansas City later this year. Um, distribution is always challenging because you have to have kegs to be able to send them out, so we're in the process of adding more kegs to our keg float um, and once we have that we'll, we'll start Kansas City. We're looking at some other markets in the Midwest but since beer is food and we definitely want to focus on St. Louis and probably three four hours around here and feel there's enough of a market around here. There's people people around here like their beer and that they works for us. <laughs> yeah. How do they make their own beer? Um, it's just a type of caramel malt. So basically just roasting it uh, at, diff at a different temperature just to kind of caramelize. Um, I didn't think it's probably just a, yeah, it's, it's, type of, it's a type of caramel malt. So you would roast it a slightly, at a slightly higher temperature to get a little bit more aroma and flavor out of that. Which, which of your beers took you a little longer to get the way you wanted it? They're never there. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm a perfect, I mean, they're, are, all the beers are fine, but uh, I mean, there's always this little tweak you, you make. I mean, there's always something you find, uh, say, foam stability could be a little bit better, or maybe this needs a touch more hops, or maybe a slightly different hop variety. So we're always tweaking a lot, trying different things, and again, not something that would be hugely noticeable, but just kind of that, that fine tuning that, that uh, needs to get done to keep it interesting, too. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the growth of the use of hops uh, in the craft brew market, particularly in the U.S. Do you have a personal opinion or philosophy on, on high hop amounts or uh, what's going on? I, I personally, I mean, I find it interesting to use higher, hop or higher amounts of hops in a beer, but it, to me it still has to be drinkable. It still has to be, I still have to be able to drink at least a couple. Um, just adding more of something doesn't make a beer better, and I think without getting too frank, maybe uh, I, there's some people out there that probably just add hops just to add hops. They don't necessarily look at the flavor or what that does to the beer. I, I personally like very highly hop beers. Um, I like our double IP and, and enjoy that at home quite frequently, but um, I, I still want a beer that I can enjoy a couple of, even if it's highly hopped and if it's still, if it's, it's very bitter. But again, that's personal preference that somebody may disagree with me on that. Yes? Uh, what's your most successful uh, product so far today? The, the beer that we sell the, sell the most of is, is Zwickle. Is our, it's probably about 40% of our volume, which, um, I, again, is, is kind of, people probably wouldn't see as a, as a classic craft beer because it's a lager. Um, but it does show, I think, at least in my opinion, that people want something that they can enjoy. Typically, beer is the beverage of moderation. It's something that you enjoy with friends and um, hopefully, or not always, to just get drunk and, and, and because of the alcohol. And I think the 4 to 5% range is a, is a good range to just kind of uh, keep it sessionable. And um, it shows that there's, I hope there's people enjoy the flavors and that's why they, they buy that beer. And, and I enjoy it because it's, Fairly subtle, but it does have some nice flavors, and I'm hoping that's why it's successful. Thank you. Yes? Will you be bringing your, is it your castle schlag back? Yes, we're going to make that very soon, because Oktoberfest is coming up, yes. Excellent. <laughs> Probably in the new brewery this time, because we need more. Yes? Would you consider um, reading some of your recipes to all brewers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Depends on what you're asking. <laughs> uh, 
I'll, I'll give you some hints. <laughs> yes? What's the right temperature to serve beer? It does depend on the beer. Um, I have to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Um, I'd say probably if you start with a light lager on the light end of the spectrum, those typically get served a little bit colder. Um, oh my God, seven to eight degrees Celsius, which is uh, 45 maybe. Um, if you go to England, their beers are typically served just a little bit at cellar temperature, which is probably closer to 10 C, maybe high 40s. Um, but it really depends on the beer. Uh, some of the beers that are out there that are barrel aged or very high in alcohol, you do want to serve them a little bit warmer just to kind of bring out the aromas and the flavors a little bit better. So there, there's no perfect answer, but typically your beer, if you put it in the fridge, your average fridge should have roughly the temperature that you should be serving. And by the time you serve it, have it in the glass, that should be pretty much where it should be. Yes? Is it possible to use flowers under the tops to change the flavor? Yes. Uh, traditionally, spices were used and hops really only has been around for a few hundred years so there was other stuff that was used to flavor or spice beer um, I think why hops obviously there's a flavor issue people probably like the flavor of hops but one of the benefits of using hops is that it uh, acts as a preservative and I think that probably is why hops became so successful in brewing beer but yeah there was spices and all different kinds of stuff used to, to make beer, historically. Yes? To go along with this question, do you ever give these samples to home brewers to try out? In terms of the stuff that we, uh, that we have? Yes. Uh, sure, I mean, we can't say we do it daily, but yeah, if, if somebody asks me, we, we, if we have some stuff left over, we have some, some stuff we'd be happy to share. Yes? In answer to the man's question about your recipes, I think you had hop fan was in Stan's book. Yes, yeah, hops, we. And it was pretty close. Well, I mean, <laughs> easy enough to follow if you know how to homebrew. Yeah, I mean, we, a uh, friend of mine, Stan Hieronymus, which he, he's one of the most prominent beer writers in the U.S. at the time, right now. Um, he actually lives in St. Louis. He moved to St. Louis a couple of years ago, and uh, he wrote a book about hops, and uh, he asked me to if I would be willing to tell him the recipe for Hopfen and uh, it is actually shown in, in that book. So it's one of the recipes he printed. So it was, was fun to put that together. Yes? Do you normally work like a 12 hour day or 15 hour day? Or? I don't count. because <laughs> It would be very depressing if I would. Um, my wife does and it's not good. Uh, something like that. I mean, it's. For just thanks, thanks to computers, you don't really have to be at work to work, but I, I enjoy what I do very much. It's been very much fun to put the stuff together and work with the people that we're working with and, and see when people come to our taste rooms in the beer hall and kind of see how, how people enjoy themselves drinking the product that we're making. It's, it, is, it is very satisfying to see all that, so it doesn't really matter if I work 10 or 12 hours. Not asking my wife, though. Uh, what originally got you interested in brewing? Um, I always wanted to do something that had to do with biology and chemistry, and then ended up working for a small local brewery in my hometown during the summer just to make money and pretty much just delivering beer and working on the bottling line and kind of got sucked in from there, I guess. And um, it, it, is, it is fairly small. Um, seen around the world so you know a lot of people and that makes it makes it even more fun because you always have connections you can go pretty much anywhere and know somebody and see breweries and have a beer with somebody so it's not just the product it's also the process that's fun okay yes uh, we do make cider so we do ferment apple juice some weird law that we have to make some a certain amount of cider, but we, we do make a little bit of cider. Other than that, enough, uh, we're going to use some honey in a, an upcoming beer, but um, other than that, it's pretty much grains, barley, wheat, rye, a little bit of sugar that we use for some beers. Yes? Is there a significant change in the brewing process 
between a batch that is like a low alcohol percentage compared to the higher alcohol percentage? Now, typically, it's just the amount of malt that's used that will determine the alcohol content. There's some minor things, but pretty much just you typically you start with the same amount of water because your tank size is that, and you just add different amounts of malt to that and then get different strengths. Yes? Um, do you think that there's some kind of industrial advantage to having that 10% margin for error where some companies have like an exact chemical that they expect to produce every single time? That's where the art comes into play, I think. I mean, it, yeah, I think it makes it fun. I mean, as I said, we, we do work with, with natural ingredients, so you, you, it's not, not always, and plus, who says what is perfect? I mean, we, we define what is perfect, I guess. And since I'm perfectionist, I'm never, never gonna get there, so it's, it's this never-ending story of being able to kind of play around and see what, what works and what doesn't work. I mean, you don't change your recipes on a daily basis. You make minor adjustments over time, but um, it is definitely part of the fun to be able to kind of tweak it a little bit and not have to hit that exact thing over and over again. Yes? Uh, understanding that every beer has a, a special sort of connection to you, does one in particular have a really strong place in your heart? That's a hard question. Not really. I mean, it's it's it really. I mean, I enjoy different types of beers at different times, but I can't say that there's specifically one that I could pick. I uh, impossibly answer. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>